This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So the, uh, the, the next talk that I've been asked to do is to talk about disasters. Um, I, and and uh, I, I guess when you do a lot of that stuff, you, uh, you learn that you, uh, you do have a lot of disaster. Uh, that's a kind of a, uh, something that you have to, uh, to learn to deal with. And um, I'm not going to say that none of those are mine, trust me. So uh, uh, the three questions that I was sort of asked was, uh, can they be predicted, prevented, and I guess treated? Uh, these are my disclosures. So what I'd like to do is try to answer, do, answer those three questions, and basically is to try to learn how to avoid disasters with, uh, over the years, over the past 20 years, I've learned to avoid, I would say, many of them, but not all the time. Uh, I'm talking here about proximal complication. We're not going to talk about the distal stuff, but really just proximal uh, TVAR complication. And obviously the most devastating one is retrograde type B dissection. It's probably, uh, it, it is preventable in some patients. I'm not going to talk much about that, but I'm going to talk about uh, accidental branch coverage, type 1 endoleak, and graft collapse. I've got the three little cases of that that I'm going to discuss in the next couple of minutes. But to answer the first question, can they be predicted? Yes, the key is high quality imaging. That's, that's very essential. You need to have, be very careful about your maximum aortic diameter that you wanted to treat. You, want to, you need to know your true and false lumen. You need to define the landing zone. You need to know the arch radius. That could be very treacherous in, in uh, uh, doing TVARs in the arch. The type of arch, if you're dealing with type 3 arch, again, a much different uh, uh, animal to treat. Endograft sizing is the key. Branch vessel status is important. And can they be predicted? Yes, if you have good quality imaging and if you read it properly. Can they be prevented? I think the key is preoperative planning and execution. So every case that we do, we really have a drawing here. This is a patient with the uh, aberrant right subclavian that had also another double subclavian uh, uh, transposition. Wishful thinking does not create a landing zone. I can tell you that, and I see that all the time, where people think, no, no, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be OK. You've, if you don't have a landing zone, you know, wishing it was there will not help you. Uh, accurate and controlled deployment is essential for arch delivery. Uh, so can it be prevented? Yes. What to do about it? This is an example of a graft collapse. This is a TVAR for a, a traumatic aortic injury. This is an old case. Uh, and you can see how the graph has collapsed uh, completely. Uh, usually, a lot of people see that when something like that happens, what you have to do is actually you know, convert to an open uh, thoracotomy. Uh, that patient was not a candidate for that. It's actually an old patient. Uh, and uh, so we do, we, this is an IVIS pre redo TVAR. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with IVIS, the first thing to do is to not move the probe. It's very hard to teach the fellows to do that, but just don't move too fast. You can see all the metal here is collapsed around the, uh, the uh, IVIS uh, probe. And that's what's quite fascinating with the graft collapse is it's actually a dynamic process. And you can see how the graft here is, is behaving exactly like the septum of an aortic dissection. And it really is collapsing in, in, in with, uh, with systole and diastole. You can see how it's moving uh, in, in, uh, around the uh, the uh, IVIS probe. Uh, here's the uh, IVIS after a redo TVAR, and it is possible. It's tricky. You need to try to really get your wire across all of this. Uh, you can you just sort of carotid artery here, subclavian artery right here, and you can see the uh, endograph here is uh, has really opened up uh, uh, completely. Obviously, this was a, with a different endograph that had much more radial force. Uh, and here's the uh, post-op CT at one year. So it is possible to treat a graft collapse with a redo TVAR tricky but uh, doable. So uh, can it be treated? I would say uh, a lot of those complications can be treated with endovascular technique. Branch coverage, this is a 79-year-old female patient with a symptomatic chronic aortic dissection. Uh, you just saw the dissection here. She also had renal malperfusion. 
but the, uh, the big thing here is that she also had, had a previous uh, ascending replacement. There's a renal malperfusion. Uh, and uh, so this patient, I did a left subclavian transposition to the carotid artery. You kind of see it here. You can see that there's a tag andrograph that's being positioned here. But in that patient, one of the main issues that Dacron andrograph here really caused a, a buckle of the aorta between the native aorta, the, the arch, and the ascending graft. And that's often the case. Another kind of patient that do that will be the elephant trunk patient that you'll treat. That buckle can be very treacherous. And unfortunately, the tag is not a controlled deployment in my hands anyway. And this is what happens. The tag really, uh, we like to see they jump forward. They don't have, uh, uh, they don't, they don't have an actual life, the graft. So when, they, when it happens, it's actually your fault. It's not the fault of the graft. Uh, something that some people have a tough time understanding. So I, I had to do, I had to do a, a very quick left carotid puncture, put a sheath right through this. Uh, and what I did with, uh, with this, I then did an eye cast uh, with a chimney stenting to basically reperfuse the, uh, the left, uh, left carotid artery. Subclavian is right here. Uh, and uh, that took care of business. I would say that this is a very old case, and, and I do not have in uh, recent uh, years a single case of accidental branch coverage. If you use a system with a controlled deployment, it really does not happen anymore. Uh, this is a very frustrating patient. This is a patient with a type 1A endoleak. This is a, a very dear patient of mine, 83 year old female patient with a subclavian transposition with a TVAR, as well as a four vessel back table FIVAR that was done for a type 1 trochoabdominal aneurysm. And you would think that after all of that, that if she's going to have a leak, it's going to be down at the bottom with, uh, where I've got the four, the four vessel FIVAR, but that's actually not the case. A year later, she does present with the type 1 uh, endoleak in, uh, in the arch again. And I, I would say that currently, the most frustrating TVAR work that we do has always all to do with, the, uh, with working in the arch. Uh, so in this patient, uh, this is what we're planning to do. I've got a left brachial uh, uh, a stick here, and I've got a catheter and a sheet that's coming down the uh, left subclavian, down the left carotid artery, uh, and I'm planning to do a redo TVAR in this patient and to fenestrate the carotid artery. Uh, she was in uh, no shape at that time to uh, have a redo uh, neck exploration at that time. And uh, uh, you can see here that uh, you can see the endoleak very nicely right here. Uh, so now we have a redo TVAR graph right here. I have a catheter here with the, uh, the laser probe, uh, and the uh, endograph is deployed, and the uh, laser is done. The ICAS tinting is done with a retrograde shot into the uh, uh, carotid artery that's been uh, lasered and stinted. Uh, and uh, despite all of that, extremely frustrating, I still have a, a type 1 endoleak. It was, uh, it was a lot smaller. It was much... It was, uh, not as, as big, but it was clearly still there. Uh, and this patient, what we uh, did, we brought endo anchors right here, and you can see there's already two endo anchors, and that third endo anchor is actually the one that actually did it. It was just enough to bring the fabric down on the arch, uh, and uh, the completion the autogram in this patient uh, really showed the no residual uh, endo leak. She was discharged after three days, no stroke, and this is a CT at 12 months, uh, no endo leak. You can see the uh, left common corollary uh, laser fenestration here. So in summary, I think proximal TVAR disaster can be for the most part predicted and prevented uh, with high quality imaging, with careful preoperative planning, with uh, judicious patient selection, and uh, a bit of technical mastery that I guess it takes a few years. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Fascinating stuff. I think I'm going to, uh, I'm going to want to, to, to quiz Dr. Panettone very closely on some of the details of that, but I think we can do that offline. Um, we'll have the next slide, please. The, the, the disasters that I'm most concerned about are not the disasters that come to you or the disasters that are uh, attributable to the pathology, but uh, the disasters that we create ourselves when we don't pay attention. Um, so here's the, the first case, 58-year-old guy, treated at an outside hospital two days previously, and subsequent to that, developed renal failure and abdominal pain. Now, I don't, unfortunately, have any of the imaging that uh, he showed up with, but this is a little shot from the OR. I think you can get a sense of what's going on. There is a, the supraceliac implantation at the distal end of the stent graft, 
and you don't see any celiac branches, you don't see any SMA branches, you don't see any renal branches, and the reason is that this is the true lumen running up the side there, and actually you see maybe a little bit of lumbar action there, and that's all. So basically what they had done is implanted a stent graft proximally in the true lumen and distally in the false lumen. You would think that's hard to do, but it's not. That's very easy to do. What we did is put up a snare in the true lumen, sorry, a snare in the false lumen, went up the true lumen, and punctured from one to the other, captured the wire, made the hole a bit bigger with a balloon, and then we were able to connect these sufficiently that we could implant an additional stent graft. Luckily, they'd left us a little bit of landing space there above the celiac artery so that we could recreate an outflow into this, the true lumen. Of course, you still have the false lumen here, um, but that's a, a problem for another day. And here you can see here from flow, there's that false lumen brewing some trouble for another day, but at least we have nice clean flow into the visceral arteries. So what's the lesson here? Well, the lesson is that the catheter can migrate as you go, as you go up from one lumen to the other and back again. Um, and really, it's the implantation sites that you have to care about. You don't really care if something goes true, false, true, right? That doesn't matter anywhere near as much. It's what's going on at the ends. So you really need to ascertain that those are true lumens that you're using as implantation sites. In the arch, you can do it. Uh, they just put an echo probe down, a transesophageal echo probe. Further down, some people favor IVUS. I actually have very little experience with IVUS. What we tend to do is put the wire up and then pull a five French sheath back and do interval angiograms, which very readily identify the branches if you're in the true lumen. Second case, uh, just to, I, I think one of the impressions that you can take away from this session is that dissection is a very uh, poorly understood, very variable, very unpredictable phenomenon, and that basically everything you do is an experiment, and that your, your next duty, having done something, is to find out what the effect is so that you can repair the consequences of that. Um, here's a patient, 62-year-old, relatively young, came in with some chest pain, and had what we thought was relatively easy anatomy. Not dissected up here, dissected down here, um, but with a nice uh, you know, distal implantation site in non-dilated non, uh, aorta, relatively short shot stent graft. Here it is, this is what we put in, this is what it looked like, it looked beautiful. We uh, actually stayed well away from the arch and that looked beautiful too. And we were horrified when she came back for a one month follow up to discover that she developed this just distal to the subclavian artery. So we thought, well, that's, you know, that's a bit distressing, but we can deal with this. So we put in another stent graft, and you can see we've got a little bird beaking going on here. It wasn't oriented quite as we would like it, but, you know, reasonably satisfactory, uh, except for the fact that two days later she suddenly developed chest pain, and the CT scan showed this retrograde dissection into the ascending thoracic aorta. So, of course, we call our CT surgeons, they fix her up. The telltale sign that they've been there are these little Teflon uh, collars that you can, uh, you can see at both ends of their repair. The repairs are often uh, shockingly short. They leave uh, you know, the arch completely unrepaired. Um, and here you can see there's uh, stent graft coming down. But of course, we've got all this here just you know, sitting to brew trouble for the future, which of course it did. It dilated, we came back. And I just put this up again just to show how easily you can end up in the wrong lumen and the maneuvers that you have to do to identify the lumen uh, access down distally where, where uh, you can navigate more easily from one to the other. And here's the ultimate repair that we were obliged to do, which was a multi-branch thoracoabdominal aneurysm. So now she has graft from the ascending thoracic aorta all the way down to here and has done reasonably well for a couple of years now. So beware the route into the wrong lumen. The dissected aorta is fragile and the uh, dissection can go up, can go down, and the false lumen can get ever bigger. Here's a patient. This, this actually wasn't, wasn't really my case. This is in the category of cases I have witnessed. 
A uh, 74-year-old man underwent an urgent repair of an ascending uh, thoracic aorta. But of course, they didn't repair his aneurysm here. You can see those telltale uh, cuffs of Teflon and then the dissected arch. And he had uh, developed some distension of his arch and of his distal uh, thoracic aorta. Clearly, this is something that needs the attention of a cardiac surgeon. But if any of you happen to be cardiac surgeons or happen to deal a lot with cardiac surgeons, you should know um, that there are some key elements to the elephant trunk that really make life easy for the vascular surgeon and some key elements that can make life very hard for the vascular surgeon. This was a repair that made it very hard. This little shadow that you see here is actually the elephant trunk. And the distal end of it here is not in the true lumen, which is this little vertical slot, but in the false lumen. And that is incredibly easy for a cardiothoracic surgeon to do, because they go in there, they don't know which lumen is which sometimes. In fact, people who do a lot of this will often place the guide wire in the true lumen just so that it's sitting there when, when they, you know, as, as a, a roadmap to where they need to go. The other thing that's missing here is a stent. It's really hard, you've got this graph flopping around in the aorta and you're planning to introduce something through the distal end of it when it has no support. And the other thing you don't have is a marker. So this thing could bunch up, you know, like sock around your ankles and you wouldn't even actually know that you, you just pushed your implantation site proximally. Um, so what's to be done? This is the distal aspect, of course, with the usual distribution of visceral origins and extending down into the iliacs. Well, we did what we'd done before, and that is use a snare in one lumen and a catheter in the other lumen and a wire to puncture between the two, except this one was an augmented approach using the Pioneer, which, you know, made somewhat of a believer of me, um, in that you could very easily see the septum, you could easily see what the orientation of the device was and where you are relative to the uh, false lumen that you're trying to puncture into. We also had a snare in there, not only to act as, as a fluoroscopic guide, but also so that we, once we had the wire through there, we could grab it, we could pull, we'd have a, a through and through wire and be in a strong position um, to create a larger fenestration. And here you can see the route of access going proximally. This sheath is actually coming uh, from the right arm through the arch, and here we have it captured going down. So there's the repair. If you'll look very carefully at this angiogram with the stent graft just about to place the uh, extension, there is the elephant trunk. So we were actually able to see it on angiograms and we're very grateful for that because otherwise you really no idea where this thing is. And here it is deployed. Not terribly clear angiogram. If you'll look down the distal end here, you sh we shot this angiogram and you can see uh oh, you know, you're not seeing very much apart from this one renal artery. Um, the thing is that this is the true lumen, and what you're looking at there is all false lumen. So that catheter was all in the false lumen. Just to make the point again, it's very easy to migrate from lumen to lumen. And the cardiac surgeons can be a great help, but they can also be a great hindrance. Thank you very much. <laughs>